All right, well, good day, everyone, and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max, and I'm joined by Flynn today again. So let's get right into it. There are a few topics we had prepared today. Uh, first one was, so your company is insecure. What do you do next? Flynn, do you want to start off a little bit on on this topic? Yeah, so the reason why I wanted to discuss this is because it's something I've seen quite a bit over time. I've been privy to a lot of different reviews, a lot of different audits across uh, across the scale. I've seen some where companies are just extremely mature, you know, these big multinational companies that have a lot of stuff in place. Um, and then I've also seen the opposite of companies that don't have any security and it's their first time ever doing something and they're just completely lost. Um, they've gotten basically zero across the board. What I think is really, really important when I give a review to a client or give me give them the report is their reaction to my findings afterwards. So I'm not by any means saying that if they come back with different things challenging, I think challenging is actually extremely important and shows that you know what's going on. And, you know, sometimes I may have not seen evidence or it could have just been a mistake on my end that I've called a certain finding. So challenging is very, very good. What I think is a big red flag is when companies come back and they say they give either a really half-assed excuse or they don't want to do something completely. So, for example, a company that I did do and they basically got zero across the board. They understood that they were going to get zero across the board, but the reason why they were doing this, um, I think we were doing a gap analysis, was that they wanted to know where they go next. And the mentality they had afterwards is like okay we know we don't have stuff where do we start what's how do we secure our information assets that are most crucial to us Mm. um on the flip side i've seen companies that are more secure from a technical standpoint but they've been extremely extremely lazy or they've shown really bad red flags with uh certain findings uh obviously i won't name any names but one company was a very, very simple thing that they could have fixed. And they basically just said, oh, this is too hard to do. Uh, that was an, an immediate red flag. Um, a little bit of a heartbreaker as well. Because I was kind of like, oh, you, you know, you got all the good things as well. And, you know, the people were very nice um, there. But, you know, sometimes that just is the case. And that's, I think that fosters a really bad cybersecurity culture. And, you know, the people that were working at this company were brilliant people, very security focused in some senses, but then just didn't see the need for other things. Yeah. Um, that comes back to something we've said before, like technical versus governance. Sometimes you get the most technical people in the world and they just don't understand the need for certain governance controls um, and vice versa. Yeah, right. So it, it sounds like a bit of an issue with rigidity. So they were, they were a little bit more rigid, a little bit more I don't know. Un, was it uncooperative? Like they weren't they weren't uh, feeling the need to fix any of their issues. Is that what the issue was? Yeah, it was kind of like that. It was more so they did understand the issue, but they just were kind of taking a very laxed approach to it, even though it was very clearly a problem that could be exploited um, at any point in time. Something I wanted to ask you, Max. So. This is something I find in, you know, governance reports and, you know, technical stuff as well with finding gap analysis. And I'll give some guidance about how to uh, tackle certain issues. But if you find an internal vulnerability within your systems or if you find a, you know, maybe a penetration report came out that's found a, a vulnerability, what's the sort of process that you recommend that people take? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So it sort of depends a little bit on how big of an issue the vulnerability is i think like if you're seeing a uh what is it like a uh a, a cvs 10 uh something like what was that what was that vulnerability that happened over christmas that one year log 4j <laughs> if it's like a log yeah. j level thing versus a i don't know like an old like an out of date like ssl or ssh communication going on It sort of depends. So if it's a really bad vulnerability that everyone's facing and everyone's going nuts, the process for it would probably be raising a ticket in your company and 
trying to get it actioned ASAP and, you know, pushing the, the product owner of the software to update it straight away, get, get managers involved, get people involved that are going to get that patching across the line as, as quickly as possible. I think that's like a really important uh, aspect of it is you have to ask for help, obviously, and make sure that there are, there are people behind you, backing you, saying that you need to, saying to these you know developers or whoever owns the software that they need to fix this problem. It becomes a bit more of a tricky one when it's less of a, a doomsday scenario, right? Uh, it's, it can be more so that you want to, again, you know, raise a ticket, have some communications with the team that owns the software, but you probably want to get it that solution, that fix integrated into whatever your patching cycle is. So if it's fortnightly or monthly, you probably just want to try and tag it in there, get a get a small team with a uh, a proposal or a, um, a sort of way to get that solution, you know, implemented with the least amount of pushback and least amount of issues pos- possible. Yeah, that was something I was going to ask. Is is there is there like a formal approach where you you know you write up a proposal or a report, as you say, and you got to go to executive management before you actually target the issue or is that less common uh from what i've seen it's less common but it, again it sort of depends on what the issue is and how bad the you know the ramifications are from messing up the patch like if it's a old software that you haven't used in a, and well, not haven't used but in a software that you haven't been on the ball using every single day if it's more of like kind of a an older one then it probably doesn't matter too much. You don't have to go and get executive help for that, but you know you still want to try and try and get it done. Uh, yeah, probably asking a senior manager of some kind, and yeah, pushing for it that way. Yeah. All right. So uh, in the news, NIST 2.0 finally came out. It was in draft for a while, uh, but exciting stuff. So a bit, the biggest change to NIST 2.0 was that it added the new function, which was govern. Uh, basically, I haven't gone been able to go through the whole thing because it's massive. Yep. But the govern function, basically, uh, if you look at the NIST framework, it used to have basically like a sort of pie graph, I suppose, where it had little sections coming out of it. The govern function now goes around the whole thing and it basically encapsulates all the different sections within govern, um, which I think is actually, it, it's really, really good. Um, NIST is all, obviously across the board with all this stuff. It's kind of the gold standard in terms of frameworks obviously you change it a bit depending on your organization and you know what regulation you need and what you're targeting like if you're doing software applications you're probably going to use iso instead uh but yeah the govern function um really good because it basically that's what governance is um you know it's not particularly one section it's more all-encompassing because you know Certain areas may need governance, certain other areas need a completely different type of governance. And it's about managing cybersecurity. Yeah. Was there much of a difference between the draft version and the final one? Uh, not that I'm aware. I'm pretty sure they like quite literally said, like, this is probably gonna be the what comes out, but we're just putting it out in case anyone sees any glaring uh problems with it. I haven't seen any massive differences, but um yeah, it's it, it's live now. So uh, NIST generally nobody has a com- or at least in Australia, you don't have to be compliant with it. Uh, it's more so a framework people follow to either show their due diligence or because they don't really know what to implement. Uh, but it is a fantastic one. If you don't know uh, which framework to use, I recommend using NIST a lot of the time. Mm. Not the entirety of it because you. That's way too much to handle at the start, but taking uh, parts of NIST, extracting that for what's relevant to your organization, um, and then using it alongside other frameworks as well. Yeah. So NIST is free, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that's good. I think, yeah, sort of having governance as a, as a bigger, you know, focus area is, is pretty good. I, I think that there's, when you're running all of these applications that you have, that you've got, and you've got all these different resources and places where you store data you know it's important to make sure that governance and people are, are, are there who are going to be making sure that other people are doing the right thing and staying compliant with everything it makes a lot of sense yeah uh, 
sorry, I actually got it the wrong way around. The gubbin's not uh, around the outside. It's actually around the inside. Oh, but um, right. still the same, uh, the same response, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, so that's good to see. Um, you know, it's always great to see big strides in cybersecurity. Yeah. Yeah, so I was at an identity conference last week and there was a few really good points that were brought up. There was a panel discussion and there was some, you know, uh, back and forth a little bit, talking between the panelists and some good questions being uh, asked. There was a good one that was brought up by someone who works at Westpac. Or, sorry, they got asked this, the person who works at Westpac. And they mentioned going further than a third-party risk assessment. And with, obviously, CPS 230 coming out and having fourth party as a new thing that's going to be added on to making sure that you're checking up with companies that you interact with. How would you say, Flynn, what are some ways that you can go further than a third party risk assessment? Not so much like having a fourth party risk assessment, but having more correspondence with uh, different companies you're talking to. Yeah. Or an nth party risk. Uh, I've seen people say it like that as well. Um, so yeah, a, a big thing with uh, APRA findings with a lot of companies with the CPS 234 stuff and also just in preparation for CPS 230 um, a lot of stuff has been coming out that current measures for third party risk assessments just aren't really good enough um, one way that a lot of companies manage their risk was using you know some something like CyberGX or UpGuard or similar tool where they basically have all their vendors within a uh, within a management system, uh, they assess them for vulnerabilities and they get a questionnaire from them and that's basically it. Uh, what I've been finding that APRA has come back and said a couple of times is that that's not really good enough. I think the main issue with that is the attestation part of it rather than uh, an actual review or an audit. Um, so attestation for the audience is basically, if I say to Max, hey Max, I have the greatest cybersecurity ever. And Max just goes, oh, okay, sweet. And he gives me the thumbs up and then I'm good to go. Whereas a review or an audit would be, I say, hey, I've got the best cybersecurity ever. And then Max would be like, all right, can you show me your uh, your, your IS policy or can you show me your incident response plan? Um, and I, I think that's what APRA is really looking for right now. Um, and I think that's really critical for companies to do, especially with obviously not all of your vendors because, you know, if you have... 50 to 100 vendors so imagine trying to do an order on every single one you're going to like be spending uh, hundreds of millions probably <laughs> yeah. um but more so you know identifying your critical vendors which is something that uh we need to do as well um identifying your critical vendors and then assessing them appropriately so you know doing an actual review slash audit on them generally against cps 234 because you know in CPS 234, your vendors are supposed to be compliant with uh, CPS 234, mm. which can be very, very difficult, uh, especially depending on who you're working with. But, you know, that's kind of what's going to happen. Yeah. And, you know, it's going to be a big, you know, rude awakening for some industries that, you know, they rely on the financial sector and stuff as their third parties, but they just don't have the same measures in place for themselves. And, you know, they don't even know what CPS 234 is. They don't even know um, these certain things. And, you know, the, it's it's got to happen eventually that um, I don't think many of them are taking it too seriously right now, which is a problem. But um, two to three years from now when, you know, companies are eventually going to have to just start saying, hey, we're not going to use you because you haven't sorted this out. Yeah. Um, that's when it's going to be a rude awakening for a lot of companies, I think. Yeah. No, no, definitely, definitely. Sort of comes back to making sure that you're like onboarding and staying, you know, in good communication with people who are respecting your company as well, right? Who are, who are yeah, I eat. think I think the relationship management is critical. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can afford it, if you're a big enough entity, maybe just having someone that's their whole job is just relationship management. Um, looking after, you know, talking to different vendors, sorting stuff out, because it's a big job. One, I wouldn't really want to particularly do myself, <laughs> but someone's got to do it. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. So I guess uh, another thing where we're, we're going to have a little bit of a, a talk about that I found at that conference as well was 
dealing with legacy APIs, legacy networks, legacy communication protocols, you know, what are some ways that you're able to untangle the mess that you might have where, when you're, you have this, you know, big clutter of systems that are running on really old versions of you know, TLS, SSH, and um, like, what are some ways that you can kind of go about, you know, potentially even unupgradable uh, systems, you know, I, I thought it was interesting to, uh, to um, sort of talk about this one a bit. There's a, there's a bit of a, a, a tricky sort of situation you can be in when you have a lot of old networking systems, old applications, you know, I think the, the first step in the right direction is making sure you're not adding to the mess. So ensure that you're, when you're getting new applications, make sure that they're able to be compatible with, you know, uh, new, like whatever identity system you're running. So if it's single sign on or, uh, you know, another one that's a bit of a, uh, <laughs> a, uh, a buzzword at the moment is skim which means system for cross domain identity management, which it's basically just useful for managing identities in cloud-based applications. So making sure that if you're getting new applications, that they're not a step back, you're not going to have to spend years fiddling with them to get them to bend to your systems. They should already out of the box be, be ready to go like that. But in terms of legacy systems that are already there, it's a bit of a tricky one because if they're so tangled in, in a mess, you don't want to like unplug something and then, you know, cause a, a massive incident that wipes down your, I don't know, public website or something. Well, probably, and I'm just sort of, this is just my opinion. I think that it's best to section off parts of your, uh, systems, your legacy systems. So segmenting them into different areas and then looking at what are some of the things you can replace with mineral impact. Now, it doesn't mean that you need to just unplug everything and switch it to the cloud. might not be the best way, but it might be important to lay foundations. Maybe maybe look at the way that you have implemented newer solutions on a new uh, framework or a new networking system and see if there are any similarities that you can port over to your old systems and have them, you know, kind of run similarly to that. See if there are any commonalities there. I probably wouldn't recommend wiping and starting a new, completely starting a new. I'd say it's probably not the best best uh, method for it. But yeah, segmenting areas, making sure that you're tagging resources and tagging business owners, and you know who owns what is such an annoying issue if you're in a massive organization with a lot like thousands of apps and th- not thousands of apps, but thousands of connections going on. Making sure that you're able to communicate with development teams. And obviously, if it's an unupgradable system, then, you know, you might have to look for a, a, a new way of implementing change there that you, you, you know, you can't just, you know, change over. Or you might need new architecture for it completely. But, yeah, I think the, the way you go about it, yeah, segmenting, uh, segmenting areas of the, of the old architecture, communicating closely with teams that are in charge of it and coming up and proposing solutions that don't hinder the convenience, right? It's such a thing we say every week. It's convenience versus security. You want to make sure that you're proposing seamless uh, solutions that are going to cause minimal impact. Yeah. Or if, uh, if you have no choice but to implement something, yeah, the, as minimal impact as you can manage. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.